now, um, just so we can share out this recording on our YouTube channel after the, after the session. So I'd like to welcome everybody to the latest installment of the Iowa OER webinar series, where we cover topics that are relevant to people embarking on OER or open education projects in Iowa. And, you know, if this is a call that you participate in regularly, or if you work kind of in OER, um, if you have topics that you'd like to see covered in any of these webinars, you can always send us a message through um, the Iowa OER Action Team's um, Google group. So if you just go to our website, I'll post all these links in the chat um, once we get started, but um, you can always sign up for that listserv, and that's a great way to kind of get in touch with new resources that are being published in the state. Um, events and developments in, in the world of OER in Iowa. So it's a good one to follow. Um, my name is Mariah Burnett and I'm the Scholarly Communications Librarian at the University of Iowa. And I'm joined today by a panel of University of Iowa professors who have developed OER for language learners. So they'll talk about their projects. There's actually two teams here. And um, then we'll leave time at the end for some discussion and some Q&A and some, some conversation about common issues in, uh, in developing OER for the languages. So first I'll introduce our, our first team of presenters who will be discussing the goals and impact of their project to reimagine the course resources used in three introductory Italian courses. So we have Lucia Gemani who completed her master's and PhD in Italian at Indiana University. Her main research interest is the literature and culture of the Italian Renaissance and Baroque, and in particular, the interconnection between literature, music, and theater. She's published articles on early modern epic poems and Renaissance theater. Most recently, she's been working on the examination of gender and war in the early modern period. In second language acquisition and methodologies, her research focuses on how to foster intercultural competencies in the language classroom. While at Indiana University, she collaborated in creating an ebook for intermediate level Italian, which I will not try to pronounce, <laughs> but it was published as an OER under um, Indiana University. And she also won a grant for the integration of that ebook into online and hybrid courses at Indiana University. At the University of Iowa, she teaches courses in Italian language, literature, and culture, where she likes to combine a wide range of materials from literature to music, comics, theater, and movies. And she'll be joined by Irene Latini, who holds a PhD in comparative studies from the University of Siena in Italy. At the University of Iowa, she teaches Italian language, literature, and culture, and serves as a course supervisor for the elementary Italian one and two sequence. Her main research interests focus on Italian silent cinema, contemporary cinema, and the relationship between film and the other arts. Her most recent publication includes essays on the 1910s cinema and contemporary film, and she's presented papers on silent, modern, and contemporary cinema at numerous national and international conferences. And the last uh, member of that team is Claudia sardini Rideau, who holds a degree from the University of Siena as well, and received a master's degree and a PhD from the University of Iowa. She's been teaching as a lecturer at UI since 2012, and during her time at the university, she's been teaching Italian language and culture and developed online language courses through the DOE. And so that presentation will be followed by a talk about creating intermediate Spanish textbooks for education professional, professionals by Giovanni, Giovanni Zamati. Dr. Zamati is the director of the Spanish Language Instruction Program at the University of Iowa. His research interests include second language acquisition, technology for language acquisition, pragmatics, and critical discourse analysis. Ready Study Spain, a virtual reality training for study abroad students, is one of his most ambitious projects. He started working on this VR experience as a dissertation project, and he's currently trying to develop a standalone version that could be used to acculturate students before their sojourns abroad. He's currently working on various projects, including designing a few OER textbooks for Spanish and a big data project to improve success and reduce failure and withdrawal in a big language program. So what I'd like to do is just uh, have us all keep our microphones muted during the presentations, but if you have any questions or any, um, any comments or anything, just feel free to drop them in the chat and we can discuss them during the Q&A time. And once again, the recession is being recorded, so um, just FYI. And I will now turn it over to our Italian team. Uh, we'll start. So I will start. Let me maybe this good. 
Now, our project comes from our idea to redesign the entire elementary one and elementary two sequence and to create an e-textbook uh, with two main uh, um, objects, main uh, objectives and main goals. First of all, we wanted to help our students achieve the uh, GE program outcomes. Uh, many students are actually taking our uh, elementary one and two uh, classes to fulfill the language requirement. But at the same time, we wanted to prepare students for experiences abroad. Uh, so our uh, new e-textbook has mainly two goals. The first one, uh, we wanted to uh, support um, the students' acquisition of grammar and vocabulary that can ensure uh, meaningful communication. Uh, and at the same time, we want them to appreciate uh, the importance of lear learning a new language, and in this case, learning the language that is known as la bella lingua, uh, Italian language. At the same time, uh, we want to uh, enhance uh, students' familiarity with Italian culture. Now, today, students, th thanks to several platform, uh, platforms, uh, students today have access to uh, Italian cultural products. Uh, Netflix is a streaming platform that produced a successful Italian TV series or uh, there's one probably the most recent Italian film that was produced by uh, Netflix or now there is this uh, popular um, series on CNN and um, even if they don't uh, have access to a TV series, uh, sometimes the uh, students somehow have a contact with Italian culture to, through um, um, games, video games. And that was a pe popular video games. It was released about 10 years ago. Now, the idea is that uh, to enhance students' familiarity with Italian culture so that even if they had have the opportunity to travel to Italy or to take advanced courses on Italian literature, at least they can appreciate better uh, the products on Italian culture that they can access on um, online platforms today. Uh, we started our project by uh, considering our students' needs. Uh, first of all, our students needed a user-friendly user grammar presentation. Um, grammar is important in Romance languages and particularly in the Italian language uh, to ensure a meaningful communication. Even the most basic uh, um, communication in Italy needs uh, gram grammatical structures. Uh, the problem is that uh, most of the time um, commercial textbooks have really detailed and complicated explanations that are overwhelming for our students. Uh, we needed a user-friendly grammar presentations in, term of, uh, in terms of content, format, and uh, page layout. Uh, we had already seen this uh, even before we applied for this grant. We noticed that our students were actually benefited from um, some charts like this ones that you were supposed to see here. There are simplified uh, versions of uh, the grammar textbooks. That's just a summary uh, of two chapters of the textbooks that we were using before. And there were two chapters that were preparing students uh, for uh, what I used to call the killer quiz. Now, in this summary, we were using a user-friendly grammar presentation that was actually helping our students prepare for the quiz. Uh, we decided to build on this material uh, and create some new uh, grammar handouts that are um, easy for our students. First of all, because the content is really selected and only the most important element of the grammar is actually presented. At the same time, the format is easier for our, is easier for our students as our students will see it. Yes. Yeah, let's give it like this. Uh, um, our students usually uh, benefit from uh, simplified charts like the one that you see here. There is a mini conversation at the end so they can see how the grammar is applied in everyday conversation. And it's a user-friendly page layout so that students can take notes on uh, this handout actually. Um, beside the user-friendly grammar presentation, what we wanted for our uh, new textbook was the opportunity to add some um, real and practice activities. And now today, uh, 
thanks to some websites, uh, instructors have access to um, tools like the one provided by GameKit on Quizlet to create uh, some drill and practice activities. Uh, we were able to integrate those tools into our own uh, project. And after considering our students' need, needs, we had to consider and to merge our students' needs with our own needs. And first of all, we wanted a format that was, a format that was easy to update. Um, with grammar and with, with Italian culture in general, you, you, you always have new contents that you want to add. And at the same time, we wanted a format that was easy to adapt. Uh, we offer uh, the elementary Italian one and the elementary Italian two uh, courses. At the same time, we have an intensive elementary Italian that is a, the first semester and the second semester combined together. So we wanted a format that could be adapted to the intensive course. At the same time, a format that could be adapted to other courses, like for example, the Italian for the professions, in case we want to create new courses. And the other things that we wanted um, integration into ICON for uh, easy access. And this is our web page for uh, the elementary Italian one course. And by clicking on specific number, uh, student access. Uh, the module uh, overview, that's how our students see it. And in the overview, they have the material that they need that specific week. So uh, they, they have the grammar handout there, you see the preposition in journal miss. They have the vocab that they can practice. They have the assignments. And this is, for example, is the homework for that specific week. And they have some lab activities that we were able to create by uh, integrating the GameKit platform into our own icon platform. Um, now, uh, before we uh, explain a little bit better our how our um, textbook works, uh, one thing I want to point out is the impact impact of uh, this project. Now we have about 120 students in the full semester and about 80, 80 students in the spring semester. And uh, with this project, we were able to uh, provide significant cost savings for our students. Uh, this has been always one of our priorities, actually. Even before, when we were using a commercial textbook, we never used a um, um, a writing a textbook, a workbook for uh, for our textbook. We actually created our own course pack. That is this one that was created by uh, Professor uh, Emerita Debbie Contrada, and we had it printed at a copy center of the university. It resulted in a cost of five uh, six dollars for students. At the same time, we took advantage of the uh, Icon Direct opportunity. And we were ordering actually our textbook through Icon Direct, and it was pretty accessible in terms of uh, price. It was only thirty-five dollars. The problem is that uh, that textbook wasn't uh, supported uh, any longer by um, the, the the publisher, so somehow we had to consider some uh, different uh, textbooks. And last year, when we applied for the grant, the price range of commercial textbooks was going from uh, sixty five dollars more or less for uh, Avanti, the textbook that you see there, or over three hundred dollars for uh, the Vista uh, textbook that is Sentieri. And I'm talking about April 20, 2020 when we applied for the grant. Um, now those textbooks are even more uh, expensive. So some uh, with this project, we were able to provide really significant cost savings for uh, our students. Uh, I'm going to show you how our uh, textbook is going to look like. We just started creating and moving the material that we had already integrated into ICON into our new uh, platform. Uh, it's Piacere is going to be a, a UI press book, uh, book. And this will be the cover. 
No? And we just started creating the content, but I can show you, for example, uh, this chapter that is going to have the simple grammar explanations that I showed you before with a little bit of conversation. And again, and we could integrate the vocab using other platform that were avail available to, that are actually available to instructors today and activities that can be created as home activities or in-class activities uh, for us or for other uh, instructors that might uh, use our own uh, textbook. And now, uh, both Claudia and Lucia are gonna show you some examples of how we integrate our uh, project into our daily uh, class activities and Claudia, you should be able to. Um, um, I think I'm ready. So yeah. uh, let's see if it lets me, there you go, yes. Uh, of course, uh, one of the targets in lear learning a foreign language is to improve one's vocabulary in the target language. And when it came to the vocabulary, our goal was, first of all, to limit the number of vocabulary terms that students had to learn for one chapter, one week, or whatever, one module, to a maximum of 50 terms. Our old textbook, Prego, for one chapter sometimes had more than 100 vocabulary terms, which was covered in one week. And let's be honest, students will not memorize 100 new terms every week. So limit the number of terms to a maximum of 50, and then use the vocabulary in a variety of activities in class and at home, whether those are uh, drills, class conversation activities, listening comprehension exercises, reading comprehension exercises, and writing activities. Um, so of course, our students, as Irene said, can access the vocabulary both via their icon, the icon site or through the e-textbook where there is a section on the vocabulary, which Irene just showed. And in the in the e-textbook and in ICON, the vocabulary is in the form of a Quizlet, which is great because it allows students to practice their vocabulary with drills at home, either using the flashcard mode or any of the other uh, game modes that are available on Quizlet. And it also allows us to use uh, the Quizlet in classroom activities. Um, I, for example, once or twice a week, start class with Quizlet Live, and that allows students to compete against each other is a game. Uh, I usually give them as a reward, like one extra credit point that will be added to their homework for the week. But um, it wakes them up, especially these days that we are in, um, in Zoom meetings, uh, it just lets them compete. They are competitive by nature. And it's also anonymous in a way, except for the winner, because each student gets given an animal name. So nobody feels bad if they really do poorly because nobody knows who they are pretty much. So it's a great way to start class. Once they practice this vocabulary with drills, whether in the classroom activity or at home, uh, then we use uh, those terms that they have learned that week, either in daily class conversations, which are simpler than what Lucia will be talking about. Those are more targeted conversation activities. These are just back and forth questions that we use with students, like in the case of the vocabulary for the house, for example, uh, I will ask students to describe their house or a room in their house. And there is this back and forth 10, 15 minutes of classroom conversation that we use. And there are listening activities, listening comprehension activities that can be easily incorporated in the e-textbook or can be used in classroom. So students will have access to a short audio file. I'm not gonna play it for you because it's my voice and it doesn't sound that pretty, but like 30, 50 second listening uh, file. And then students have to answer questions to prove their uh, listening comprehension of the file itself. Um, this can be done at home. Uh, as a written, I mean, listening and then writing answers down, which of course, in addition to letting them practice their reading, their listening comprehension skills also allows them to practice their writing skills because they have to produce complete sentences. Or I often use it as an activity in class. So students will have to listen and then 
uh, respond orally to the questions. That way, not only they practice their listening comprehension skills, but also their speaking skills. Um, and then um, reading exercises based on uh, the vocabulary for the chapter or module or uh, week, whatever we want to call it. So for each vocabulary section, uh, we can have small, simple reading assignments that can be done, can be integrated in the e-textbook, that can be done at home independently, where students read um, the, the reading assignment and then answer questions on that reading assignment. Again, they don't only practice their reading comprehension skills, they also practice their uh, writing skills in that case. Or I often use them in as in classroom activity. And again, at that point, the students work in pairs, they practice their reading skills, and then they use their uh, communication skills, uh, answering those questions uh, orally. And of course, then we test the writing skills, uh, both with homework assignments, short compositions, or in quizzes where they have short compositions to, uh, to do. And then uh, Lucia will talk more about more targeted uh, conversation uh, practices that students will do. Sorry, I couldn't find my, my, you can hear me, right? Yep. Okay, awesome. Um, so, perfect. Um, so, the, this conversazione or conversation, um, it's a new activity we introduced this semester, these past two semesters, and we created for the textbook. Um, the goal of this activity was, of course, clearly to improve student speaking skills, um, which it was an overall goal that we had for the whole book, which is why we simplified grammar and used more vocabulary in class to allow the students to practice, practice, practice during our time, the little time we had together. Um, and of course, facilitating class com uh, communication in the second language and uh, improve their confidence in speaking uh, the Italian, of course, uh, which in, in end would also facilitate the transition to intermediate courses, especially because most of them con continue for four semesters Italian. And our intermediate courses are uh, almost fully in Italian uh, from day one. They have uh, more complex readings, um, um, weekly conversation hours, etc. Um, but of course, the need was students practice, sorry for the typo, in and outside of the classroom and uh, adjusting the schedule. Um, particularly these two semester during the pandemic, we had to teach mostly online and uh, we had to adjust our overall schedule of the semester from four days to three days synchronous activity, one day asynchronous activity. And this was a good activity um, to give the student to do at home that can be later integrated into in-class activities and uh, a textbook for also homework if we want, if people want to use that that way. Um, and uh, the students need was clearly um, to have repetition of um, the same structures we see in class, which they also see in the quizzes. Uh, without using too much of their time because they are already overwhelmed by uh, a lot of homework. And especially this year, like I said, um, with the online teaching was very overwhelming for the students and for us. And so we wanted to find, they also want to find something that is easy to do. And it doesn't require too much technology because yes, they do like to use technology, but most of them are not very familiar with a lot of technology. They, they have uh, often um, some issues and um, especially um, when it's videos and audio technology as we have probably seen in all our Zoom meetings lately. Um, the unspoken needs of course is to have activities that have low affective filter that don't make them feel on the spot when they have to speak in class understanding and communicating with professor and classmate in Italian in class, which often happens and makes them feel uncomfortable. And of course, for those who continue the preparation for the intermediate level. 
Um, and for very few of them, especially this year, preparation for abroad programs and summer programs in Italy. So the solution we find was this conversation day. Um, like I said, for this um, semester, it was an asynchronous activity because of the teaching um, uh, needs and the teaching structure uh, due to the pandemic, but it can be used as a homework activity or as an in-class activity as I will explain in a second. It's a bi-weekly conversation activity, um, which alternates in our uh, courses with the quizzes. Uh, it's a self-recorded video and it's only graded for completion, which like I said, was one of the goal to lower the effective filter of this um, um, type of assignment. Um, so the student can do it and still get the points uh, if they speak Italian, even if it's not perfect and we still correct them, but um, it, it doesn't make them uncomfortable doing it. Um, and of course, the flexibility allows for flexibility for both asynchronous and in-class expansions. Um, the guidelines are both in English and in Italian. And the, uh, as you can see, it's fully integrated with icons. So it doesn't need any extra technology, but it also allows them to record it on any type of video, even their phone. And it's always specified for how long as we would do for an exercise in class, right? Uh, we would give them, you have two minutes to complete this. Um, and it's also, we found a way to do it not overwhelming for also us as instructor, when you have to, to correct and watch videos, we always kept it to up to two minutes, three at the most. Um, and like I said, the instruction are both in English and Italian, meaning that also the questions are both in English and in Italian. Um, and particularly, this helps them to understand what they're talking about, but also answer to the questions without having to read anything, which is the requirement really for this conversation. Uh, and this way, they don't really need to prepare anything extra from what they do in class. There is no confusion on what they're asked in, they're asked to do, and no really extra works and and my favorite is they don't need translators to find vocabulary because we do all of this in class. We start from week one. Um, this is a conversation for the first week of classes of elementary one. These are all questions that we do from day one. Um, so as you can see, we're not asking them to do um, any extra work and they felt all very confident to do it. I, I wasn't able to produce any video today from my students last semester, but, but um, both my colleagues and I, and we can assure you that they were very happy to do it. And it was very enjoyable even from week one. And it gives them immediately the idea that they will need to speak in Italian and they shouldn't be afraid of doing it. Um, furthermore, this question, like I said, are a reinforcement of in-class conversation, the same one that Claudia was talking about before. Um, so they don't really need to translate these questions because they have seen them in class for the whole week. And when it comes to this uh, conversation, they just basically review this question, which is also useful for their quiz, basically. So they learn how to answer them even for when they need to do it on the quiz. Um, we review the vocabulary, um, uh, which is always uh, suggested what modules they should refer to. Um, and grammar uh, is often uh, underlined if we especially we ask them to use a specific um, grammar uh, structure uh, for that conversation. And in fact, in the question, you will find questions with that grammar structure. Like in this case, according to how you tell the story, but it's also said here, um, um, what is it? Chi ha incontrato, hai viaggiato da altre parti, would use passato prossimo versus um, imperfetto. Um, most times we also give suggestion for creativity and expansion, okay? Don't know how to end the conversation, give advice. So we have them, 
produce a little bit more, especially for those who want to try and speak a little bit more freely in Italian. And of course, it also fixed the problem of needing personal information from the student if they don't want to give their own personal schedule, for example, they can invent uh, a character and give their schedule instead, in this case, for example. Um, in the uh, um, handout that you saw before, we also I, we also added the um, a group possibility a possibility for a collaboration, which was very appreciated this past two semester when students were not meeting in class, especially, and it can definitely be used in class as well as an uh, elaboration of this conversation in, when we use those in class. Um, it's framed as a challenge, uh, as Claudia was saying, they like to be competitive, but it also gives them some uh, ideas on how to expand those questions into a different topic or enlarge that topic. When we integrate those um, 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 conversation into the textbook online that will be the final product um, uh, besides our online, uh, sorry, icon integration. Uh, as you can see, we have the same structure uh, of the conversation as homework that we did uh, that I just explained, but we also expanded into an in-class activity to show how this conversation can be used in class um, uh, if one doesn't want to use it uh, just as a homework assignment. And like I said, the asynchronous activity is exactly the same, uh, just um, different in format uh, and colors, I guess. Uh, the in-class expansion, of course, uh, um, uh, includes a preparation to the conversation with a focus on the vocab um, and a couple of activities. You will see here that the tips and tricks questions are not in Italian because we want them to uh, work together with possibly a partner to recreate the question, remember the questions that they have been asked during the whole week in preparation for the conversation. And of course, there is an activity to do during the conversation so that it's not just blattering and starting to speak in English as soon as they want and they forget what to ask. And of course, a report back converse, um, activity uh, from that conversation with an example of how to do that report back, a reminder of the grammar they should use, and a, just a hint of what they are supposed to do in case they didn't realize what they were supposed to do at the beginning in Italian. Um, and just to conclude, the, in the e-textbook version, uh, we have included some instructor's notes um, to help whoever what will be using this uh, activity and this book to actually integrate these activities into their class discussions or uh, class days. Um, I think that, I mean, that's basically it. The idea is to really integrate this material into a textbook that can be used uh, for any teachers who wants to teach elementary Italian. So it's very simple uh, to the point and it allows a lot of expansion in class um, and gives some guidance also if someone, if teachers don't have ideas of how to do that, we're gonna offer some help in, to, in doing that. So thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was great to get a look at these materials. They're so beautifully laid out with great images. And it's, it's great to see. Does anybody have any questions for, um, for this group before um, I turn it over to Dr. Zamadi? We'll have plenty of time at the end too, I think. All right, hearing none, I will turn it over. You're on mute. Thank you. Hi, so in my presentation, I will be talking a little bit about OER in general, how me, uh, how I dealt with it and we created a textbook and all my, our experience on creating a textbook. And then the last part is gonna be some useful tips for faculty that they are just starting developing new OER material. So the first part is just mostly like, while I was creating an OER textbook, I was starting to question if it was worth my time because creating OER, it's time consuming. 
So I started looking at research and a lot of researchers found out that students using OER are getting better grades and classroom using OER has exp have experienced a decrease in WF and withdrawal rates. And this is even more substantial when looking at students from underserved backgrounds. So it's really important that we try to use OER. Mostly the decrease in DEF and W rates can be attributed to the fact that with an OER textbook, students receive the textbook from day one. Sometimes students are waiting for financial aid to be able to afford the textbook and they buy that on the third week, fourth week of class and they lose a quarter of the semester. Another important, important aspect is money saved. Students are gonna save a lot of money as my colleague from Italian were saying earlier, textbook can cost up to 200, $300. And when you count that students are taking four class per semester, that's a thousand dollars easy. Another important research that I found out that should be a good motivation for us is that uh, the perception of student for the faculty member that used to you the decide to use VR. They think that faculty member are more kinder, more encouraging and more creative. So this is something to consider. And then uh, the majority of students and faculty who have used OER and commercial textbook believe that OER are of equal or higher quality. So the quality of this textbook is pretty good. There are also some pedagogical, ben pedagogical benefits in my opinion. This content can be tailored to the student to suit the needs of the 21st World Century students. We can adapt the content. It doesn't have to be the same content that this is the 10th edition that was just like slightly updated. You can change it. You have more ab the ability to change every single part of the textbook, even if it's a textbook that you did not create. It's easy that easily adaptable, as I was saying. And also you can involve the students. There can be students participation in developing the textbook. They can help you develop some activities. They can help you develop some grammar components that might be hard to understand for them. And they might come with some real great idea for you. It's not all happy. There are some challenges. challenges. Selecting, adapting, and creating resources. Just a lesson plan or a full textbook is time consuming. I think we spend a few thousand hours, maybe 1,000 1, hours, maybe more, just to create this textbook. So it's a lot of work. Finding high quality material is possible, but it's hard. You are not gonna get a publisher coming to you and say, hey, this is the textbook. Those are the benefits of this textbook. Then another one is gonna come the, day out, the other day to your office and showing you all the options you have. You have to look for them. There are a lot of repository, but sometimes textbooks are not published there. So you need to contact people and look on the web. And then there is also a lack of online homework platform. A lot of language programs, they use kind of like a flip method or a hybrid method where students are doing a lot of online homework at home and then they come to class already prepared. EO, OER doesn't allow that. There are workarounds for that. There are options that you can do. You can create activities on your LMS. You can use Duolingo like we have doing in the past but you have to put extra work. It's not really like the one from the publisher. And then language teacher have another big problem. This is a traditional textbook. As you can see, a traditional textbook for a normal classroom, not a language classroom, is full of text. It's basically just content. To write the textbook, you just need to know how to write, know your law knowledge, and you're done. If we look at the language textbook, they look totally different. There are pictures, there are videos, there is interaction. So there are all those other components that will require new skills that you either develop or you find someone in your university that is able to do it. And I'm posting a link here for an introduction to OER for language teachers from the University of Texas. I'm gonna post a few links in the chat so that you can have access to all of them. And so we can see that the language textbook has many components. 
there are activities that involve all modes of communication, interpersonal, presentational. There are authentic and interactive materials, vocabulary list, grammar section, cultural sections, plus the online platforms that we all know, like VHL, My Spanish Lab, MindTap, and many others. So by looking at these, we can notice that developing a language textbook is gonna be harder than just developing a normal textbook. But there is a good thing. How many language teachers prepare additional activities? I think most of them, at least all the instructors in the language department are creating additional activities to supplement the textbook because sometimes you don't like what's coming up in the textbook. Even this semester I had to create additional activities while using the textbook that we created. And we created the textbook with intent to not have to create additional activities. But due to COVID, I was teaching in face-to-face, -face, but we had to create some sort of social distancing. So certain activity, I had to adapt them because I didn't want the students to go around in the classroom and to mix too much. So we all do that. And if we are all doing that from creating additional activities to creating and developing OER materials, we are very close. We just need to be a little bit more careful in the material we use so that it can be shared freely. And it's important also when we are creating OER material to be sharing that because we are not just creating it for us and for our students, but we can share it for, with our colleagues and then our colleagues will share their material with us and our students will benefit of it. So said that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the textbook that I created with Fernando Castro Ortiz from Binghamton University. So we decided to start from scratch for one simple reason. All the commercially available textbook for Spanish for educators that we found out that there was these needs in our department because we have a lot of students studying Spanish, but they are also willing to study in the education department to become high school teacher, elementary teacher. So we wanted to offer them some more Spanish targeting them. The textbook we will find if they were cheap, they were outdated, they were mostly workbook. Some of them were also expensive. They were costing like 120, $130 and they were basically black and white workbook with a lot of activities. Also the level of those textbooks was for beginners. And we wanted to offer this class as a fourth or fifth semester of Spanish. So they will not work. Other textbook for these, they were just terminology. So we didn't need that because those were terminology might be useful for a teacher that is already teaching and just want to learn some easy words in Spanish. And another problem that all those textbook had, they didn't have a reliable, well-developed platform for online homework while the commercially available textbook for Spanish, they all do. They all have excellent platforms, but those textbooks, they're kind of like a niche product, so they didn't have it. So we had to create something. And this is the final product. We are gonna really publish it for everyone this summer, but if you want, just send me an email and I will give you access to it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this book and how we arrived to this book. We had to decide, follow some guiding principle. The most important thing for us was a backward design. So we had to create the learning objective. The content of the textbook was important to us. And to do this, we send a survey to many educational stakeholders, asking them about what do you think it's more important for future education professionals to learn before coming in the job market. By reviewing the survey, we were able to create our learning objectives for our textbook. Then we also wanted a textbook that followed our teaching approach for a student-centered classroom with thematic module, a focus on meaning, where grammar is only presented, integra is integrated inside the textbook, but is not fully explicit. And then it was also important for us to consider adaptability and accessibility. We wanted this textbook to work for us with our hybrid approach, but we also wanted this textbook to work for other people that maybe have a more traditional approach so they can change, switch stuff around and make it work. And also accessibility was also important for us because 
everyone should be able to access this textbook. So we had to create, for example, subtitles for the videos. We have to all the infographics. We created a PDF version with a text so that people with impaired, uh, impaired view, they can read them. Uh, we created the textbook using four thematics module. Each module is divided into this subsection or sub chapter. I'm gonna talk just for lack of time, just about a few of them. Uh, the projects, those are the formative assessment. They are task-based projects. They involve all modes of communication and they allow the students to develop professional and critical thinking skills while still practicing Spanish. Uh, ideally, they will start working on a project at the beginning of each chapter. And by the end of the chapter, they will have a complete project that will be shared with the whole classroom. Then the lesson, this is the most traditional part. Each module has three lessons and each lesson can be taught for two or three classes or like 50 minutes to one hour each. They are, each lesson is designed around few authentic artifacts and includes a variety of communicative activities and grammar and vocabulary. As I was saying before, it's fully integrated in the content. And the last part of the chapter is a guided discussion. This guided discussion presents an in-depth discussion about relevant topic about the module just studied. Uh, there are preparat some activities that the students can do before reading the article. So they are kind of like pre-reading activities about vocabulary or about like creating some small questions that will guide them in the discussion. Then they can read the article and then they can have a full in-class discussion. It's also very split in many tasks so that when the students arrive to have the discussion, they can have a full discussion in Spanish. And then we also have some interactive activities. This is, was another interesting part of our textbook. While we created the textbook using Pressbook, we wanted to create to integrate some activities that will be like kind of created in H5P so that the students can receive self-assessment. The self-assessment is important because it saves time in the classroom. You can also assign some of those activities to your students at home and they don't have to worry about knowing if the answer is correct or wrong. They can just get instant feedback from the activities. Another important component of our textbook are the videos interviews. While working on this textbook, we recorded seven or eight Spanish uh, interviews to Spanish speaker living in the US involved in the educational field. We had students, teachers, parents, a superintendent and a school board member. So this is to present authentic material, show to our students that a lot of Spanish speakers are involved in the educational field in the US. So they, see, they can notice the importance of studying Spanish while studying, preparing to a foreign educational career in this country. And this is just the timeline. We started in January, 2019 with an idea. It took us so long to come almost to an end. At the beginning, we thought that we will be done by fall 2019, but, or spring 2020, but it took us one additional year. And now the last part of the presentation, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some useful tips that they are totally based on my experience. So before you start, like an important thing is you need to identify your need as a teacher. So why do you need this textbook? Is there something already available? Can I adapt something else? Or do I need to start from scratch? Also, you need to identify your students' needs. What are my students gonna want from my textbook or from my material? Are the students gonna benefit from this? Another important thing is to create your learning objectives way before you start. It's the hardest part to do when you don't have anything, but it helps us a lot to have clear and defined learning objectives when we were developing all the chapters of the textbook. And then spend some time looking for potential grants. There are many opportunities and you can have grants to pay for your time. You can have grants to pay for expert people that are gonna have skills that you don't have, you can pay graduate students to do other work for you. So they are beneficial. Another important thing, 
know your limits. Start small. You can have a huge idea, an amazing idea, but start small, a little bit at a time, and you're going to be able to do it. Plan in advance. Ask your question like, am I going to need help? Can I do this on my own or do I need a team? Uh, what type of help am I going to need? Do I have enough time to complete this project? Am I going to be able to complete it between teaching classes, doing research, and everything else we're doing as part of it? Another thing that helped me greatly was creating a spreadsheet. We actually had two or three spreadsheets. But you can have one with learning objective. Then in another page, you can get all the experts that you're going to contact. So you can organize everything in spreadsheets or in another way, or maybe on a piece of paper, everything that helps you. But try to stay organized. And then set a timeline. Most likely, you're not going to respect it. But it's good to have some sort of like deadline that you have to follow. Build a team. This is really important. We started as a two people team, but then we started seeking help from other people. At the end, we had help from at least four graduate students for this project. We had help from other offices from the university. We had the studio helping us with recording. So it was really useful to receive a lot of help. Ask the library, other organizations and offices in your campus if they know someone that can help you. Colleagues. So many of your colleagues might be willing to help you and even collaborate with you. And also undergraduate and graduate students, they are a valuable resource that can help you. Another important thing is picking the right platform. This is gonna take a lot of time in deciding where am I gonna put all my hard work. Some people decide to do a simple PDF and that's a good option. It's super easy to create, easy to share. It's not that big to share, so it's a good option. Another option could be use your LMS, Canvas, Blackboard. This is, for example, a class a textbook created by the OER. Uh, I don't remember which one, but an organization about OER and they created these modules all on Canvas. And it's accessible to everyone. Other options are like create a custom made website. Some there are some options for this in Spanish. For, for example, there is Trayectos from the University of Texas. There is Accesso from the University of Kansas. They're the big teams. So they were able to create custom-made websites that will host the whole textbook. Another option that is still offer plenty of opportunities and possibilities, but it's a little bit easier for a smaller team is to use a dedicated platform. OpenStack is the most famous, but is not suited for language teaching. It's more for like standard textbook. But then there is LibreText from the University of California system, if I'm correct, that can host language textbook. It works really well. It has an online homework platform and is fully integrated into Canvas. And then there is Pressbook that the, this is the one we decided to use. And we ended up using this platform mostly because it's supported by our university. So the University of Iowa is supporting it. There are three or four experts in this platform that can help us. For example, we needed to duplicate our textbook. We send them an email and they will do it for us. There were some problem, things not showing up. They will fix it for us. And then another important part that sometimes is forgotten in when developing an OER textbook or material is to create an evaluation plan. I think this is very important to guarantee quality and control of your material when you are sharing it. And this is just what we did, but there are multiple things that you can do. Have peer reviews your material, create rubrics on how to review this material, uh, send a survey to your students, uh, test it in your class before publishing it. This is what we did. Maybe some people prefer to share it first so that they can receive more feedback and also pay attention to accessibility, like plan a review about accessibility. And this is exactly what we did. So we had some peer reviewers. So we send the textbook or just chapters of the textbook to various colleagues around the United States. We also looked for students' feedback. So every time this is, every time we were teaching this class, we created a survey to share with our students to compare this textbook with a normal textbook and see where to improve. And also we did the testing in a classroom setting. 
We taught this class in the spring 2020, fall 2020, and spring 2021 with three different instructors. So we asked this to those three instructors feedback and we had 60 students involved. And of course, while doing this, we were doing constant revisions of every feedback received from, from all those people. Those are my works cited and thank you everyone for coming today. All right, thank you, Giovanni. That was really interesting to see your site in action too. I've heard a lot about these projects and so it's very exciting for me to see them in action. But um, if anybody has any questions at this point, um, you can go ahead and unmute your mics or type them into the chat and we can kind of open things up for discussion now. Well, I had one question, um, just addressed it, anyone actually. Um, can you speak at all to how your classes have changed since you've been using OER? I mean, have, what has the reception been like from students and has the, the class itself changed much? Well, I can start. One, one of the benefits is that, at least for us, is that our students didn't get lost. Uh, it's very common for our students getting lost in between different type of materials, the textbook and then the workbook and then the um, LMS, I mean, icon for us. Uh, our students have everything there. It was really, really targeted for our students. So they have access to what they needed without really getting lost in this uh, the different uh, platforms they, they were using. And that was particularly important in an online learning environment. That was something completely new. So having the opportunity to have everything there from the Zoom link to uh, the assignments that they had to complete to the material that they had to study, that really helped our students. I mean, at least was my experience when I used it, yeah. Yeah, my students appreciated that as well. The ease to access it, but also the way um, it was easier for them to, to study the material. The, the, even just the grammar or the, the conversations, they were all there, easy to access, easy to uh, view and easy to understand. Right. Um, I also should say that um, we change students, of course, because we teach different sections. So we change from the first semester to the second. Um, so the, the real uh, proof will be next year when we have the in intermediate, the students that we had in elementary this year. But I have to say that when we um, that seeing students in the second semester that we had in the first semester, it was already different. We saw a difference from previous semester when we um, students. I don't know. I, I think they're more prepared in any case. They're uh, less afraid of um, uh, taking this language. They are less uh, resentful of having chosen Italian instead of a more known language in Iowa. Um, and so, like I said, probably the best um, review of this will be next semester uh, when we have um, uh, intermediate these students take an intermediate and it will be uh, a change um, but um, I, I, I think um, we're on a good path um, I can see it in our students in the feedback we have at the, at the end of the semester um, it's been um, easier on them too it's it, and they didn't I don't think they suffered any change in pace or situation. Um, uh, keep in mind that most of our students take Italian because someone in their fraternity has taken Italian, so they know what to expect or in their sorority. Um, but I didn't hear complaining about this change of pace at all. We have a comment from somebody in the chat that says, um, she likes how there was an intention to limit the content to avoid overwhelming students. I know sometimes we want to give them everything and I think that's a good approach to give them like a need to know so they can manage their time and then provide optional resources that are nice to know. <laughs> yeah, I can echo that too as a, you know, I mean, it's been a while since I've been in school, but I always appreciated that. <laughs> Any well, other questions? That was 
Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. go ahead. I was just going to ask for more questions, but. Well, you know, I just wanted to comment on that just to say that that was one of our intent, actually. Uh, the idea that we were using a textbook that had a lot of content, a lot of information that students weren't really actually internalizing because it was too overwhelming for them. And at the same time, they were paying too much for that. So sometimes your students were paying a lot of money for a textbook that has a lot of information that students are not even able to actually retain. So that was one of the reasons why we decided to, to go with an OER. Uh, less content, user-friendly, and uh, less money to pay, yeah. <laughs> We have a question from Belinda. She said, was it, was it easy for you to integrate modeling in OER, particularly for conversation practice? Um, for Italian, definitely. Um, uh, I think the easy, the, the fact that we wanted to have a very, very um, simple, simply structured material that you can adapt to class um, to anything that you want to do in class that really helps because uh, first of all um, we're all teaching in different ways and so all of us were able to use this material um, because it was so simple and uh, like I said the conversation we mainly had them doing this semester these two semesters as an assignment because of the pandemic situation uh, teaching um, uh, situation so um, we model uh, we, we definitely used uh, we used them in class um, and we were we used to use this type of activities in class anyways before right um, but um, by giving them something to do at home uh, it helped them to um, really try out the language. And I think they like to try out the language. Some of them really uh, went for it. I had some people really meet up on Zoom and record their conversation. I had, um, I, I had students presenting other people in their family who didn't speak any Italian. They were teaching Italian to them so that they could have their conversation. I think it was a, a good tryout. Um, Uh, there's a comment here too from Richard, um, having students participate in the content development process being great. And that's, um, I would like to just kind of echo that too. That's really kind of a focus on our OER program at University of Iowa right now is kind of incorporating OER in the classroom in an effective way and making sure that we're making the best pedagogical choices that we can with these new materials. And so um, it sounds like both teams are sort of doing that and it's, it's very exciting to see. Okay. All right, it looks like we are a little late on time. Apologize for going long, but I'd like to thank our guests today. It was a very informative webinar and thanks to all of you who attended. Um, we'll be posting the transcript and the um, video on YouTube probably within the next day or two. All right, have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you.